For the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world slash donate or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today I'm speaking with Chiara Francesca. And with that, to never approach the choices that people are making as good or bad, right? But to approach the choices that people are making as the very best choice that they can make under the circumstances in which they're living. Originally from Italy and currently residing in Chicago, Chiara is a queer artist, writer, organizer, acupuncturist, immigrant, and former teen ma living with multiple disabilities. Their clinical focus is on mental health, trauma, CPTSD, and queer trans health. She is committed to building collaborative spaces for community care and centering collective health in and out of movements for justice. Oh, Chiara, I am so happy and really filled with joy to be speaking with you. Just want to say that I, um, yeah, I feel really connected to your work and it always brings me a smile and groundedness and a feeling of not being so alone. So thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you. That is so humbling and just so kind. Thanks. Mm, yeah. Ah, well, as we open, I just want to recognize that we are all experiencing the world through our bodies. And these bodies are marked by trauma and love and pain and health and all that goes on around us. And taking the time to ground ourselves in our embodied reality seems particularly important for your expertise, Kiata. So I'm wondering if you could give us some insight into what it means to be aware of our bodies and the way that they feel in this world. Maybe it would be nice to begin by, you know, as you as you ask that question, I think about all the bodies that are hearing our voices in this moment, wherever they are, and just taking a moment to take a collective breath together, perhaps, <sighs> and to acknowledge, right, that as our disembodied voices reach all of us, we sit with our flesh and bone organs and all of it, all of it, as we are so used to being in our brains, right? And in our thinking, thinking body. Um, yes. Um, and also, you know, as I think about embodiment, I think about the path that it took to be a little bit more in my body at least and how um so much of that path involved not being in my body and disassociation and the contentious relationship to disembodiment and disassociation and really you know one of the keys to to be more in my body was to start seeing uh disassociation as a friend instead of being at war with it and to see it as one of the set of tools that um, got me to stay alive and to really transform the relationship to the ways in which my body responded to trauma and responded to external stimulus or responded to just being alive in the world. And instead of, you know, forcing embodiment or, you know, almost having like hacks for become to, you know, for coming back into my body to instead appreciating and becoming just as good friends 
to the moments in which I had to leave my body behind. So that's what comes up with that question. And I think in my work, you know, as a healthcare provider, there is a lot of holding space for folks to become friends with all of the um, strategies that kept us alive and also then to expand and learn other tools and to always connect and bridge our bodies to the systems that they are living in, reacting to, and learning to uh, move through, right? In your work of acupuncture, you experience this embodied reality not only through your own body, but also in connection with others. As both a participant and a practitioner, how does acupuncture blur the lines between self and other and show us the ways even our physical lives are not separate from those of others in our community? Talking about acupuncture is, I think it brings me immediately to how I learned acupuncture and to um, being really aware of the specific context in which I learned that medicine. And um, because of that, um, having a very specific angle at which I understand and answer that medicine and, you know, to be more specific, right? Um, I learned acupuncture in a really specific context, which is divorced from its source, which is Chinese medicine, right? And divorced from the reality in which the medicine arose. I learned acupuncture as an Italian immigrant in the US, right? Um, Learning in a school that is uh, mostly white teachers, that is chaired by a white man uh, and where most of the students are white, uh, even though the city itself, it's two thirds BIPOC. Um, So the version of acupuncture that I learned is imbued in that reality, right? Uh, I learned Chinese medicine in a US environment that is white supremacist and also where the medicine itself was fetishized and where the power relationship um, of the how the knowledge was passed to other people was unchecked and unquestioned. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, I graduated in 2018, right? So this is recent, recent history. Um, and talking to other people around the country the kind of reality of what Chinese medicine schooling looks like in the US is close to what I described, right? Like what I experienced was not a fluke or um, an anomaly. And be- so because of that, I think it, there, it does not feel, I, I, it's hard for me to talk about anything that is specific to acupuncture as a medicine because the way that I learned it was so distorted. And I just want to mention as part of that, you know, that there is work being done now to think through what a more liberated, you know, pedagogical system uh, might look like um, to learn Chinese medicine and other medicines. um, And that questions who needs to be centered in teaching the practice, right? And how the practice itself needs to shift Um, to not replicate uh, colonial dynamics and white supremacist dynamics. And I just want to uplift the work of Influential Point and Dr. Tamsin Lee, um, who have been um, uh, really vocal in picking apart and surfacing how the acupuncture field um, has worked uh, in the United States. When I think of embodiment and acupuncture, I think more about how I came to acupuncture and the uh, lineage that I hope to practice acupuncture out of, which is the lineage of healing justice, right? And of 
liberated medicine within a U.S. context. And um, so my first encounter with acupuncture um, was actually at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit, which is the big kind of movement conference um, that has happened in Detroit, I think, since 2007. And this was in 2010 or 2009. And the way I encountered acupuncture is that I showed up to this place that was called the Healing Justice Practice Space. It was a free space for folks to come that were there for the conference and sit uh, and receive ear acupuncture. So, you know, as I sat in a circle, um, this practitioner came to me and put needles in my ears. Um, and, you know, I remember being nervous and also looking around and being in a communal space with other people um, that I did not know, but I trusted because we were all, you know, movement comrades. And that the needles in my ear, um, you know, immediately had this effect on my nervous system um, where I felt relief from, you know, the anxiety that comes at being at a huge conference with, you know, lots of sensory stimulus. Um, and also that the space itself mattered so much. It was a politicized space. It was a communal space. And it was a space where I could show up um, with less defenses up. Um, so I came to acupuncture through this framework of healing justice and, you know, through being in relationship with politicized healers um, like Tanuja, uh, Jagernath, Adela Nieves Martinez, uh, Stacey Ehrenberg, and Yoleta Donawa. And these are just some of the folks. The framework of healing justice itself um, is grounded in the work of movement for movements for justice and liberation. And as I understand it, it has crystallized in the work of Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective, um, the People's Movement Center, um, and some of the architects of this framework are Kara Page, Charity Hicks, Anjali Taneja, Mia Mingus, Shira Hassan, Susan Raffo, Maria Mekaba, um, and many others that have dreamed up the possibilities for healing justice. And also acupuncture has been used as movement medicine in the US by the Black Panthers and the Young Lords famously, which um, set up a detox center at Lincoln Detox in the Bronx and were doing ear acupuncture as a mutual aid community-centered practice to have, help folks through addiction um, and PTSD. Um, and one of the people that was involved in um, the Lincoln Hospital detox is Mutulu Shakur, who is currently incarcerated for a murder that he says he didn't commit, and there's a campaign to free him if people want to look it up and support that. So that's that's kind of the, the soup and the roots, um, both in the sense of being or trying to be aware of, you know, the distortion that I learned the medicine from, and also that the, the roots from which I practice um, comes from movements of social justice and that informs how I show up for, for this work. Hmm. Oh, thank you for sharing that origin story. I went to the Allied Media Conference back, gosh, couple, maybe it was the last one that before COVID and it was really life-changing for me. So I, was happy to be reminded through your story. Ah, yeah. Now you've spoken about the emotional experience associated with acupuncture. How might acupuncture bring us to spiritual and emotional realizations? And how does our understanding of emotion and physicality change when we recognize that we hold or what we hold in our bodies? Yeah, um, so much comes up with that. Um, yes, how do we understand how emotion um, plays out in our bodies? Um, 
you know, what comes up with that is, is multi-layered, right? There is the piece of kind of divorcing uh, emotions from our bodies as if they are, you know, separate entities. There is the reality of how disassociation plays into that, you know, and how hard it is to feel what our bodies are saying when we are in survival mode. And there's, there's a cognitive reality to that, right? Like when we are in survival mode, what's happening in our body is that the amygdala and the survival centers are online and then the cognitive function and the uh, capacity to even feel things like pain or the sensations in our bodies are diminished. Um, and with that, I think there's a lot that is not a choice. Um, it's kind of a physiological reality of what happens when we are in stress mode and how there is a separation, right, between the body and the mind that happens. Um, and also what comes up with that is the reality of um, what the system is asking of us as people who have bodies in our day-to-day reality, right? Um, so I think about, you know, myself and my own health and most of my patients. And I think of the fact that most of us are dealing with um, something that I now understand as, as systemic illnesses, right? And what I mean by that is illnesses that are caused by overwork, by stress over money, you know, by multi-gener- multi-generational trauma, by lack of access to quality food and pollution and chronic stress. Um, So as we think about our bodies and our emotions, you know, our bodies are in the soup of such larger contexts in which they have to do the best that they can. And the best that they can much, much of the time is to tamper down, right? Or like shut down the messages that are that are coming up. Because if we listen to those messages, we might not be able to like show up for work in the way that our boss wants us to show up for work, right? Or to walk around the city and withstand, you know, seeing our fellow humans um suffering, right? So when I think of Um, what embodiment needs and what what coming back to the body to connect with the messages that it's telling us, um, I think about systemic change, right? And kind of what compasses we need to build that orient us towards systems where we can grow our humanity, you know, as Grace Lee Bog says, and where we can sit and listen to what our body is saying. And not only we can listen, we can actually, um, we are able to follow those cues, right? We're able to follow those messages and we don't have to kind of tell our body to shut up because we need to get through another day, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, the practice of listening to the body when there's so much societal pressure telling us to be disembodied and to push through and ignore ourselves. It's such a, such a challenging practice at this time. May this body be a bridge for the healing of this land. May the river flow through us, cleansing greed from our hands. May this body be a bridge.
I want to talk about another extension of your work around the body, which is disability justice. And your work in the field is particularly interesting to me as you navigate the space, not only as an academic, but also as a community member and a practitioner. So how does the disability justice framework shape how you interact with individuals and communities? Yes, disability justice is a complicated beast. And part of that is, you know, I think a lot about why does the disability justice feel so different than other movements for justice? And I think one of the, you know, the best answers I can come up with for myself is that that the experience of being a disabled person operates so differently across um, what it could mean to be disabled, right? So in concrete terms, you know, my experience as um, someone who's half blind with a visible disability and, you know, other, other disabilities is so different, right? Than somebody who uses a chair or has been in an accident and lost a limb or any any of the spectrum of what disability can look like. And that reality is twofold. On one side, it makes organizing quite difficult because there is such a huge um, spread of experience, right? Not to even talk about, right, like what it means to be um like a poor working class uh, disabled person and what it means to be a disabled person who has access to healthcare um, or money, right? Like those those experiences are so, so different. Um, So that can be really tricky when it comes to movement building and organizing and bringing people together. The opportunity that I see in that is that, um, that, learning how to organize across difference it's something we have to do anyways right like in 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 the movements um in and out of movements right so that disability justice might have thought about this question of how do we organize across difference maybe for longer or or in a different way than other movements for justice right um and that's not to say that there's not tensions or divisions Um, but also questions like, you know, what choices will benefit the most of us? Um, What are some things that we can build community around? Um, Or what are the common challenges that we can tackle? Are questions that have been part of um, disability justice for a long time. And then I also think about, you know, just how much the field has changed since, you know, I was uh, growing up like in the 90s and, you know, disability was, um, disability was societally seen as kind of an inequivocally negative thing, right? Um, That um, being disabled meant a lot of things, but, you know, that it was seen as, as a reason to devalue someone or to treat them as less than. And I think a lot about how that has shifted and how we think of identities that we have no control over in movement work and how both seeing disability as negative and now I I am in spaces sometimes where I feel like my disability is actually romanticized, right? Or fetishized and how also that doesn't feel like it's pushing towards a more fully uh, human way for people to see me, right? 
and I think of that for other other parts of my experience and other parts of my identity, you know, like being an immigrant or being working class or being queer. Like I didn't choose any of those things, right? And yet in my life, um, I have seen how they have shifted from something that for which I was treated as less than to something that sometimes is fetishized. And it just leaves me wondering about the pitfalls of demonizing or romanticizing, you know, parts of people's lives that they have no control over, right? There is a lot to just explore with the topic of disability justice. And I'm grateful that you shed some light for us. And in this guide, which is called, What Could a More Just Healthcare and Healing Practice Look Like? One of the things you write is, let's talk about what building a trauma-informed, harm-reductionist, accessible, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, ethical healthcare and healing practice could look like. And yeah, I would just love to learn more about this harm reduction framework and how we ensure that we care for the caregivers as well. Yeah, you know, caring for the caregivers is being on my mind a lot as as I see more and more people that um, I'm in community with just, you know, approach or be past burnout, right? And that guide, um, I think the seed for that guide was, you know, coming home from a visit to the free clinic uh, here in Chicago or the the Medicaid clinic or like the clinic where you can use your Medicaid card Um, and just being so frustrated by what the standard of care is and also, you know, being on the other side as a healthcare worker and having people come in for acupuncture and be grateful, you know, and say thank you for things that felt so basic, right? That the very act of telling someone, you have a choice over what happens in this room, right? I'm not gonna do anything that is going to be a surprise. Um, I'm going to speak out loud what's going to happen before it happens, and then ask you if that's okay or not, and check in many, many times throughout the session so that you can tell me if we keep going, if we stop, uh, if you have a question, right? And with that, to never approach the choices that people are making as good or bad, right? But to approach the choices that people are making as the very best choice that they can make under the circumstances in which they're living. And I understand that as one of the hearts of arm arm reduction, right? That somebody has full sovereignty and agency over the choices that they make. And because we are not in their body and we're not in their life, we actually cannot make a judgment um, around those choices, right? And I think about trauma when it comes to that too. Like, I think of you know, the way that trauma has been one of the most significant forces in my life, uh, because, you know, it shaped my decision to immigrate and it shaped my decision to become a parent and to learn English, you know, or to stay in certain relationships. Um, And it has determined what jobs even I could or could not do, right? And for somebody outside of that experience, it might have been really hard, if not impossible, to understand why those choices were the very best choice I could make at that time. So that's how I try to approach folks that come into the clinic, right? By holding that they are making the best choices that they can, and then to hold space for transformation. And I mean, maybe this goes back to what we were talking about with this association at the beginning of the conversation, right? Like we cannot force our way to embodiment. Um, That what we can do is just hold space for change and to put as many things in place as we can for that change to be away for trauma and towards, 
what looks like wellness for us. Um, and with that, you know, I think that a lot of that conversation in the US especially is so individualistic, right? Like it's so much about like <sighs> self-care, right? Or like how do we set up our life perfectly in our individual bubble so that we can heal and you know, the more I think about how trauma is played in my life and the more I see trauma playing in people's lives that I'm around, uh, including my patients, the more um, I see that so much of healing is a collective endeavor, right? And so much of healing happens when we have systems in place that allow us to feel safe. And that means affordable housing, right? Like that means access to food, that means access to healthcare, that means access to mental health services. It means walking around in a neighborhood and not having the cops arrest you, right? And how not having to be stuck in survival mode is what allows healing to happen, right? And not to knock the, you know, the individual strategies that we can all learn, you know, but the systemic is where the deep, deep ch change happens. Yeah. I was really following the way you were explaining how we heal and what we need to be able to get to places um, where we have the space to do that. And I wonder too how healing can be a process rather than a singular act. And harm certainly does not happen all at once, and neither can healing. So how is healing different from simply, you know, quote, finding a cure? Or how may I shift away from looking for easy one-step solutions change the way we view harm and healing and honor more subtle forms of healing? Oh, uh, yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, so much to that. How is healing um, happens outside of finding a cure? Um, one of my least favorite sayings is um, uh, the end justifies the means, right? Because it, it's the same as, as creating just worlds, right? It, it's a process. It's the becoming. It's a state of change that we are always trying to orient towards justice. Um, and when I think about that, kind of the end justifies the means, which is unfortunately, you know, used in organizing, or I've heard it like in, in movement work and organizing. Um, and I always think about, you know, the, the means is actually all we got. Um, we don't have the end and we don't know at all what that end is going to look like. Uh, what we have is, you know, the in between and the learning and the building and they're messing up and then trying again. And that's the work. And that maybe what matters more than to think about, you know, this idea of utopia or, or what the end might be is to think about what kind of compasses we want to build and follow, you know? And I think a lot of the compasses that we follow when we're in it, it's hard to stop and realize, you know, the underground currents that end up stirring our direction. Um, and, and I think that there's something about being an immigrant that helps surface that because, you know, coming to the U.S., to me, this culture is never been normal. It's never been just invisible because it's, it's just the way it is. And so, you know, what I see as the compass in the U.S., um, in dominant culture, it's so much about accumulation and whether it's an accumulation of power, whether it's an accumulation of money, right? And even an accumulation of happiness, right? And happiness as an individual pursuit. So this idea that, you know, we could always be happier, we could always be more fulfilled. I mean, I feel like there's like some quote, you know, from like Goop um, that is exactly that. You know, it's like, you might be healthy and okay, but like, could you be more fulfilled? Could you, you know, and happiness becomes a commodity too that we can 
uh, accumulate. And so that's, that's always oriented towards this um, not yet here, you know, future that is perfect, right? So what happens if we take away the idea that there is a perfect future and instead we look at the reality of how do we orient ourselves um, in the now and what does it look like to build systems that are human-centered versus systems that are destructive? Um, and I think a lot about, you know, how do we diminish preventable suffering right now? It's not about utopia. It's not about a time where suffering doesn't exist and we're all healed, right? It's about um, there's so much harm that is occurring right now that doesn't have to occur, you know? And I mean, I think about the military, I think about the cultural industrial system, you know, and privatization and, and capitalism. And, you know, we know that those systems increase suffering. And I think about what it would look like increasing the quality of life for marginalized people, which also means for everyone, right? Through healthcare care for all, and affordable housing and reparations and redistributing wealth and you know, free childcare and forgiving student debt, right? And, and then what can happen when we start orienting towards a system that prioritizes people's wellness instead of profits is that the next step is actually beyond that curtain. And we have no idea what it's going to be, but it's going to be, I, I trust that as we orient towards justice, the future that we build are going to be better. I'm so with you. <laughs> I'm feeling really jazzed from the energy that you're exuding um, while speaking about this. And yeah, I guess I did have another question around the trauma and healing. And I guess what I'm thinking is we hold collective traumas in our bodies. And I'd like to extend this idea even further by thinking of the ways that the earth may hold trauma as well. Mm. And how do you see issues of environmental health as pertaining to those of human health? And can we even separate the two? Right. Yes, of course not. Right. Of course not. We cannot separate the two. I mean, and this is something, you know, that, in acupuncture as a medicine, as I understand it, given, you know, even the way that I learned it, that there is much more of a systemic view of the body, right? So, uh, you know, a simple example of that is that if somebody comes in with a headache, um, most of the time, the points for that headache are not going to be on the head, right? They're going to be on the hand, they might be on the feet. So the, the kind of uh, way to think about the body's health and then the body as connected to the health of everything around it is that there are so many forces that are tugging at what we think of as health um, and that the 
the way forward oftentimes is to to zoom out and to look at how these things um, tug at each other and in the positive and in the negative, right? So, and I mean, this is also part of kind of my my cultural tradition is growing up in a place where, uh, you know, the way that you eat and the way that you dress and the way that you orient yourself is really different depending on the season, right? So that in the summer, when it's, you know, a million degrees out, you do your life from 7 to 11 in the morning, then you go inside from 11 to 5.30 or 6, and then at 6, you come back out until midnight, right? So instead of pushing through to maintain a rhythm, that is divorced from your environment, you incorporate how your environment um, affects you, fully acknowledging that your body is uh, deeply affected by, uh, by how hot it is outside or how humid it is or uh, the cold winds, right? Um, and that you develop or you're taught to develop this respect for for how you are part of that environment instead of pushing through and and building artificial ways to have the same schedule regardless of it being august or january right and again this is not necessarily a pitfall of american culture i think this is more telling of how much capitalism has demanded that we leave our bodies behind and pretend that, you know, the environment doesn't exist, right? And keep producing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I just want to mention that so much of the labor of care goes unnoticed within capitalist systems. Disability justice advocate and organizer Mia Mingus writes about care saying, quote, I want to be with you. If you can't go, then I don't want to go. If we are traveling together, sharing political space together, building political family together, then I want to be with you. I want us to be together. We resist ableism dividing us. I resist my disability being pitted against your disability. We will not be divided, end quote. And this type yes. of, yeah, it's so beautiful. And this type of intimate relational care is deeply illegible to many of the systems we exist under today. So how can we look at care not just as transaction, but as relationship? Oof. Yes. Um, Mia Mingus, um, such, such a shout out. Uh, yeah, she was one of the people at the Alive Media Conference that, you know, the the memory I have of being around her is that um, it, it was one of those pivotal moments where I think I started shifting my sense of being a disabled person as somebody who moved through the world, you know, oh, with my hair. I mean, just to give you the image, you know, with like my hair in front of my face so that people wouldn't see that my eye was blind. I just have that memory of like entering the room and literally like moving the hair out of my face um, as we we were there for a a workshop on disability justice. And I'm just so grateful for her work and how, you know, it changed my life and so many other people's lives. And in thinking about uh, relationship, you know, we talked about, you know, big systems and we talked about uh, individual healing and how trauma kind of shows up systemically and individually. And I think that this quote really gets at the heart of the fact that, you know, a lot of community building, a lot of organizing comes down to relationships, right? And to conflict resolution and to healthy communication, which are things that we are not taught as the norm. And again, you know, that's true in my life, but it's true in a lot of in a lot of folks' lives, right? Like when uh, we don't have tools to be in relationship, to work through conflict, to employ healthy communications, that's when things fall apart. Um, 
and that's when you know campaigns fall apart, organizations fall apart, and projects disintegrate. And I think about that as how you know trauma shows up in organizing. Um, there was this you know TikTok um, song where this person was singing this like really fun dance song that said something like your trigger triggers my trigger (laughs) and then my trigger triggers your trigger and we go around and around and around you know and I feel like that feels like a accurate depiction of movements sometimes like we are reacting to each other's trauma and then relationship becomes really difficult and even if trauma is not part of our life um knowing how to be in relationship with each other um, is really tricky without tools to work through conflict and to communicate um, across difference, right? So I think about the importance of building tools for conflict resolution, right? For mediation, for self-awareness, for regulating, um, for even knowing what it feels like to be deregulated in our bodies and how that shows up in organizing and also in our friendships and romantic relationships and all that stuff, right? And this ties into abolition too, of course, right? In the sense that if we are to create systems of justice outside of the carceral system, that these tools are are necessary, uh, not just for organizing, but to ultimately build more just um, futures. And these quote from Mia, feels like it embodies all of that, that um, when there is a pause or when somebody stalls or when um, it's demanded of us that we slow down or, um, you know, not just keep going and going and going, that that's a very useful place to be in, to kind of be able to reflect and be able to ask, you know, why is that person being left behind Um, and what tools are needed to bring everyone and if not everyone the the most 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 people that we can um, with us as we move towards justice right there is this book called uh, I think it's called we won't leave our friends behind but you know it's about parenting right and it's about parenting in movements um, which is you know, those experiences to me in my life have felt really similar, like being disabled and being a parent and how those uh, experiences, there was not space for those experiences to exist within not just dominant culture, but within a lot of movements for justice, right? And the hopeful part of that is that, um, you know, my kids are 21 now, they're turning 22 next week. and the reality of, of movement work from when they were little kids and I was, you know, like dragging them to, to like marches and, and things to now is really different. We are having conversations about, you know, um, having free childcare at events and um, engaging with children and smiling at them and welcoming them into movements. And you know, similarly as a disabled person, like when I started showing up in in movement spaces as a teenager, right? Like not only it was not friendly to disabled folks, it was hostile, right? Like it was the kind of dominant idea was that suffering just um, was an indication of how committed you were to, to the struggle, right? And that you know, pulling an old nighter or being physically in pain or putting yourself in danger or whatever it is, was prized. There wasn't even a conversation around access, right? Whereas now, um, it, you know, it's a lot more common to even, you know, do a Zoom call and for somebody to ask, like, what are your access needs? Not because they know I'm disabled, just because that's something that is becoming part of movement work yeah so that makes me really hopeful Mm -hmm. me too yeah I've seen a huge change even the last year yeah yeah well thank you so much for diving so deeply with me and as we wrap up I am thinking of a particularly striking quote from your forthcoming book 
we will build a new compass. And you write, quote, So how are we going to do it differently this time? What are the conditions in which trauma and abuse of power thrive? And most importantly, what are the conditions under which humane behaviors of care and community growth take root and flourish? A well person is less likely to harm or create trauma. A well system is less likely to harm and create trauma. End quote. If there is any, yeah, if there's anything you want to share about your book or just any last thoughts before we wrap up, um, the floor is yours. Oh my goodness. You know, what comes up, honestly, it's what we talked, we started talking about this, I think before we even started recording and we were talking about, you know, imperfection and struggle and how much of that is underground and not, um, not surfaced. And I feel like I spent some time talking about, you know, my practice in acupuncture and trying to kind of move from a place of, um, of rootedness in the healing justice movement. And, um, I think one of the biggest assumptions that gets made is that, that somehow I have it figured out and I really don't have it figured out. (laughs) And I think it's really important to say that, you know, um, in the sense that I have not figured out how to, um, how to, um, have a sustainable model, um, for practicing the medicine and for practicing healthcare, um, in a way where I can sustain myself and where I can show up for people in a way that does not replicate systems of oppression. And in a really real sense, you know, I have to have, you know, multiple jobs to be able to survive um, that are outside of doing acupuncture, right? And I've been stuck in cycles of, you know, burnout and kind of like uh, doing the work and then being laid out um, since I got out of school. And I want to be open about that because um, so much of what we don't see is the struggle. And then we think that, you know, we are deficient somehow. You know, I definitely thought that, like, I must be doing something wrong and um, whatever, whatever, that it's our fault, you know, if our bodies are falling apart and um, or or if we're not able to make rent. Um, And again, you know, I think I had to really sit with that and with looking around at other folks that are in similar situation um, and thinking about kind of bringing it back to the systemic and how, you know, trying to live and build lives and practices outside of dominant culture is really, really hard. And it looks like swimming against the current most of the time. Um, And Not only that, that also kind of the metric for success or for what um, sustainable looks like or for what change looks like. Um, I think we need, we might need to do some work around that and how something that existed for a few months might be a huge catalyst for change that we can't even see, right? Or if you are somebody who's a care worker and did it for two years, and now you need to step away, that, that, that's not a failure, right? That the idea of like doing something forever, or I mean, obviously, you know, making money or any of those metrics are, are not so useful, right? Um, and, and I think really um, ends up making us feel like we are not doing the work when what uh, might be more useful is to appreciate the little moments, the little kind of cracks that we are uh, opening um, for other possibilities to to emerge. Mm, Beautifully said. Thank you so much. I really just feel so relaxed in my body from this conversation and inspired and excited to stay connected 
through your artwork and your writing. And yeah, I'm, I know this is not the last time I will feel and learn from you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so much, so much um, to say. And again, let's, you know, let's be open and trust that there will be so much more space for these ideas to emerge and for all of us to think through them together. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by Cy X, T. Martin, and Secret Cigarette. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Ali Constantine, Erica Ekram, Emily Guerra, Francesca Glassbell, Julia Jackson, and Priya Superwall. <laughs>